So, hi everybody, thanks for coming, uh, thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the In Conversation with um, Maggie Roberts and Aisha Tan-Jones um, with a special guest, Uma Breakdown. Uh, we're joining, um, they're joining us, which is Rez, uh, live online to talk about their current exhibition, which is uh, a commissioned show at Rez in Deptford. Um, my name is Lucy Sames. I'm one third of Res. Res is a yeah, it's a gallery and research space in Deptford, which we began in uh, in early 2015, uh, which is co-curated by myself, uh, Helen Kapinski, and Sarah Jury. Um, so today, um, maybe I'll just do um, really quick introductions to everyone that's online so that um, we can see everybody and we can go through names and pronouns uh, and what everyone's role is going to be in the discussion. So, as I said, I'm Lucy Sames. Um, I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I'm one part of Res. Uh, then there's Helen. Hi. I use she, her pronouns. And you're one part of Res. And one part of Res. <laughs> there's Sarah. Hi, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the last third of Res. <laughs> um, and then there's um, Aisha. Hi, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm Aisha, an artist. One of the artists in the show, yep, yeah, great. And then this is Maggie. Hi, I'm Maggie. I'm the other artist in the show, and I use uh, she, her pronouns. Okay, and this is Uma, Uma Breakdown. Can you speak up a bit, Uma? Oh, sorry. I forgot. Pick up the microphone. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> just, just like just talking at the screen. Um, yes, hi. I'm Uma. I'm uh, I'm a they and a them, and uh, I'm uh, yeah an artist and a researcher. Uh, kind of not really in the show, but helping in some way, writing a thing. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so we'll do proper bios in a minute, but um, for the artist and for Uma as well. Uh, but I just wanted to start by, um, by introducing the wider project that um, Aisha and Maggie's show is part of uh, and talk about um, the, the process that we've gone through a bit in developing this as a programme. Uh, so, um, well, actually, maybe first, sorry, maybe first I'll talk a bit about what we're going to do in the session. It makes more sense to do that bit first. So um, we're going to talk for about an hour. Um, we'll introduce the, um, the projects, like I said, and the artists more fully. Um, and then we'll have a, um, a conversation between all six of us, uh, mainly focusing on um, Aisha and Maggie and their work in the show, but also their wider practices um, and the process of them working together. Um, and then um, at any point, if anyone's got any questions, anyone from the audience or from live um, from the live stream has any questions that you'd like to pose to anyone specific, um, then please do put them in the um, the chat box, which is on the right of the um, of the screen in YouTube. Or you can put them. If you have problems doing that, then you can put them in. Facebook events in the comments or you can send them by email and the links to the Facebook and our email address are in the, in the information section uh, on the YouTube stream. So um, we'll be monitoring all of those different out, outlets so if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to add then um, we will come to them. Uh, we'll try and address them if they become relevant at the point in which we're talking or we'll just put them all at the end and we'll see how that kind of goes. Um, so yes, if you have any questions, do add them. Uh, so, okay, so uh, Alembic 2, which is the show that um, um, Maggie and Aisha are, um, are in, is uh, a show that opened re very recently at Res, it's still open. Um, it's uh, part of a wider project called Alembic, which is a research uh, program which Res have been working on since 2016, based around the research around the archive, sorry, the Media Art Library of the curator Kathy Ray Huffman, um, which is a, a paper based archive held by Goldsmiths, which contains mainly materials um, which relate to. 
media art, cyber feminism, net art, um, and there's also quite a strong Eastern European um, bent to it as well. So um, we had the archive installed at RES for um, about probably nearly a year, I think, and we had the um, as a reading room, and we programmed a lot of events uh, based around the materials, uh, re events and screenings um, based around this the material in the archive and the thematics that it brought up. And we had the um, the reading room open for artists and curators and uh, researchers to come and carry out um, research in the archive and develop proposals uh, based around the materials, um, proposals to RES for the Olympic program or what became the Olympic program. So, um, so after about a year of development, um, Alembic, the actual public program, began in January, uh, and it's made up of um, three intergenerational duo shows, um, which uh, the first of which was a duo show between Faith Wilding and um, Elizabeth and Putu. Um, the second one is the one with Maggie and Aisha, and the third one will be a duo show between uh, Shuli Chang and Annabelle Craven Jones. Um, um, as well as the exhibitions, there's also a publication which we are currently working on, which will launch in June, which features new, um, newly commissioned essays uh, and images from the shows um, and various other materials that's been produced from the Olympic project. So that's coming out in June. Um, and then there's lots of other events based around the three different shows. So. Um, so Olympic 2, uh, the subtitle of which is Prominence, is um, this show uh, which was, so it's conceived as the second show, basically. Um, and it's in the, the artists were selected through a process of um, open call and also from, um, by invitation as well, to respond to these materials. Um, so the work in the show, um, so the, the intergenerational aspect of it is that we paired an artist who is featured within Kethery Hoffman's archive uh, with an artist who has, who is, um, so like a more established artist who's featured in the archive alongside a, um, a younger artist that has like a, a strong affinity with that. So we're kind of trying to develop these, um, these really um, kind of fruitful relationships between artists. So, um, so chrominance is a is this um, we describe it as a post anthropocene ecocide narrative. So it's this um, I can show an image actually. It's um, it is let me just share a picture of it in school uh, in case people haven't seen it. Um, it is let's see if I can just do this. Um, yeah. So hopefully you can see that image. Um, it's, uh, this is an install shot from Res. so the work in the foreground, uh, which the sculptural works are um, by Aisha. So it's a, um, I mean, I'm not going to say too much about the show itself because I'd like the artist to introduce the works themselves, but just to give you a sense of it, um, the, the sculptural works is three kind of stone forms surrounding a pool, which is Aisha's work, and then there's a video projection, which is the, the commissioned um, film by Maggie Roberts uh, called Miasma. So um, uh, that's just one install shot. Um, when the artist is talking, I will also show other images of, um, of their works as well. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, maybe I won't say any more about specifically about the show because we'd be able to talk about it. So there's not much point in introducing any more detail, I don't think. But um, so maybe I will um, introduce the artists more fully. I'm just gonna read their bios because it's probably the most um, uh, efficient way of doing it. So I'll start with Maggie and then um, i read Aisha's and then um, Aisha's and then Uma's as well. So, um, Maggie Roberts uh, is based in both London, UK, and in Cape Town in South Africa as well. Um, she is a member of the Hive Mind Media Project Orphan Drift, 
The work of Roberts is science fictional and immersive. It complicates the distinctions between material and immaterial phenomena and dimensions, both in content and media. The work uses digital formats, video animation and Photoshop, used with watercolor, photographic collage, oil paint and sheen mediums. It coalesces out of an often intricate remixing process onto paper, canvas and video screen. Roberts is currently research fellow at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, and then Aisha, Aisha Tan Jones, uh, based in London, UK, uh, exploring energy, energy, form, and identity of the female spiritual. Tan Jones places the archetypal figure at the center of a radiant and humming cosmic worldview. Pop music, sculpture, digital image, and video mix collage, mix collage manipulation are combined to express a political consciousness traversing the universe on a quest for adventure. In, in June 2016, Tan Jones was awarded the Yorkshire Sculpture Park's graduate residency, giving them space and materials to research and make work on the grounds that culminated in a show in March 2017. And then Uma Breakdown. Um, Uma uh, is a researcher and practitioner concerned with the ways in which waste allows a play space for queer becomings. Her current research interests include Nemesis the Warlock, political refusal and dog technology. Their solo exhibition, Creature of Havoc, was recently shown at Surf in the 2017, and their digital work is featured in the forthcoming online interactive issue of Worm. Their Buffyverse Fishkin Swim Team Erotica is due to be published later this year as part of The Body That Remains um, by Compton in New York, in, that was 2017. Uh, they are, all, as the reason we've invited Uma is because we've actually, um, we've commissioned them to write um, an essay uh, around the, the around Chromanence, the show between Aisha and Maggie, and that's why um, why was joining us. So we're very happy to have them with us. Um, so um, that's their intros to them. Um, sorry, the essay by Uma will also be published in the catalogue, as she said, uh, which is coming out in June. So, um, to go into the questions, I'd just like to sort of start by uh, inviting both Maggie and Aisha to um, introduce their work that's in prominence and maybe reflect a little on the re resonances that they see between um, between their works, between each other, um, and maybe a little bit about the, the process in which they the works came about, um, but also quite you know quite um, practically what the work involves. So, um, shall we start with Maggie? Are you okay to start, Maggie? Yep. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've always um, inhabited liminal zones, or I came to realise that's what they were, and places with less human intensity and more access to multiple dimensions. And I've always been into the sublime and the uncanny and layered understandings of the real. As Orphan Drift, Ranu Mukherjee and myself have been working on a project for the last few years called Unruly City, which is about um, manifesting scenarios where um, fictional virtual versions of uh, environment uh, exist with the actual environment um, and it's been getting more and more about that Timothy Morton phrase hyper objects like so sort of intimations of climate change and catastrophe and uh, reclaiming agency for change and evolution that's not human centric so anyway uh, I came to that pro this project out of that sort of space and um, the terraformed edge lands of Cape Town, where I uh, have my studio, involve a lot of traffic of, and flow and slime and dispossessed homeless people. And there is a site for what are called Muti rituals, like medicine summoning rituals in traditional African religions, occasionally killings and massive landfill and water processing plants. 
The geography seemed perfect for the miasma idea. The water hyacinth blooms have suffocated the canals. Um, and that's imagery that took me to the sense of this sort of suppurating blossom in the film. And I was reading two books, one called The Animation of the Inorganic and one called Prismatic Ecology, when I was invited to go through the collection, Kathy Ray Huffman collection, where I found Mark and Razor's Trash Wastelands text, which says... Can I just interrupt and say that's Mark Fisher and Reza Negwistani, yeah? Yeah, oh, beg your pardon. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Carry on. Xeno communications. Communication or data traffic based on the plane of being opened by instead of being open to. People are investigating the network culture of trash or human dependency on non-human communication clusters. Such approaches may be based on trust or shadowed by apocalyptic forebodings. In either case, the landscape, the dynamically networked communication currents in matter itself, is an actor. The material landscape and its currents, the dark and vibrant matters, themselves become active agents in our habitats. Here the opposite, opposite of crystallization and glassy immobility defines the end or a new beginning untrammeled autonomous proliferation so i was yeah very excited about that and i decided to use the uh, contemporary machine vision aesthetics and their implications to introduce a sort of synthetic artificial world suggesting a gradual bleed into a virtual landscape i want to melt imagery into this um, sort of unknown from human perspective, materially effective energy in this project. So it's an aesthetic experiment. And all of the machine vision thing, or oh, orphan drifts always called machine vision, but here it's like the data moshing, the kind of degrading, that's the degrading of um, the pixel information on a screen. It melts and um, LIDAR scanning, which is the 3D scanning by um, points rather than pixels, and um, yeah, deep dream coding, which um, I can talk about a bit later. Uh, anyway, these visualizations I can't predict. It's the unknown operator in the work, and it unravels and destabilizes the certainty of the human gaze proposing a new, expansive, tactile and fluid materiality. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. Um, there's loads in there to talk about, um, but maybe we'll go to Asia next, and then we'll come back and pull out some of those things within your introduction. Yeah? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Asia, do you want to...? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, my installation um, uh, is a, well, it's named the Psychic Excavations, the Parasites of Pangu. And that name didn't really uh, come to mind until literally the day of um, the opening um, when Lucy was like, you need to name your piece. I was like, oh, yeah. And um, it's actually... Uh, the psychic excavations, I realize now, is something I've actually been doing for a while. I just hadn't had a name for it. And it's this idea that um, I'm playing the mystic or I'm playing the, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking into the future at um, the sort of uh, fossils, the fossils and um, uh, ambers and crystals that might be mined once the Anthropocene has died out and the sort of that trash will leave behind, the toxic waste we're leaving behind. Um, so these are these psychic excavations and I kind of have created them through meditation. So in my studio with all the ritualistic um, tools in the correct place and then just my uh, physical materials to create these shapes. Um, and yeah, they turned out to be a stone circle, which I guess because I really look at 
many of the ley lines and so circles that exist, especially in like UK land. Um, and that's what was kind of created from that meditation. Uh, the pool in the center of the room is very much inspired by this toxic lake in Inner Mongolia uh, called Baotou Lake, which is uh, a man-made eco disaster. And it's all the, uh, the leftover sludge that comes from the factories in the area where they make our iPhones, electronics, TVs, and um, the, the pieces of wood, which are actually leftovers from other projects. Um, the wood is, I think, foraged from uh, this one here, the more bendy one, is definitely from Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And the other more straight one, that's from Finsbury Park. Yes, yeah, so they're um, these pieces of wood that have also called to me when I see it. I'm like, I can't let that one just stay there. I've got to use that. Um, and they become my staff for the day and I take it home and I make it into art. But yeah, they are uh, based on the structures that hold up the pipes that lead the sludge into Baotou Lake. And it's just this most incredibly overwhelming piece of land in far, far away from the West where we don't even realize that that's where all our sludge is going. So that's, uh, that's how, that's what this kind of birthing pool scenario is based upon. Um, and yeah, I was also really interested in the idea of Lemurian seed crystals, mm. which are these crystals that are said to have been planted by Lemurians, which is an advanced civilization far, far away in the past, who were so advanced that they learned how to transcend um, like through their spirituality and they left all of their knowledge in minerals and planted it in the ground so that by our civilization these minerals will have turned into crystals and we can meditate with these crystals and download that knowledge um, and i really like that idea of downloading knowledge from the ground and so maybe these sort of sculptural shapes sculptural forms are a sort of seed crystal from the past um, but it was the whole time thing that I'm working with, this like non-linear time that maybe I'm something or I'm playing this character, this like psychic, mystical archaeologist from the future that's, that's digging up these works. But at the same time, I'm like Asia, the artist in London, making the works. I like switch between these characters in my head sometimes. Um, yeah. Um, what else can I think about? I also was really interested in... A lot of my work has been about um, eco disasters mm -hmm. and like eco awareness and eco consciousness from breathing and um, air pollution um, and plastic pollution. But in this uh, project, I'm looking really deeply into electromagnetic field radiation and electronic pollution and how that really is this invisible pollution that's literally penetrating our bodies, the waves from Wi-Fi radiation and from Bluetooth radiation and not, and you know, the actual physical destruction that rare earth minerals that are used in our phones are doing to the earth. Like there's 16, there's 17 rare earth minerals in the world and 16 of them are used in our iPhones. And soon, in 30 years, all of that will probably be the finite reserves of that is going to be gone. And I don't know what we're going to do. And I kind of am weirdly excited for that apocalypse to happen, just to see what's going to happen to, to, our, our, to us, what's going to happen when we can't update our iPhones, we can't get the next generation. So yeah, this is like all the things that go through my mind where, during this, this meditation sculptural creations yeah right. right thank you um that's really good to hear you both um talk so um so well about your work and you know how it's um you know how it came about um i wonder whether um uh whether you could maybe just briefly say about um just reflect a little bit on like your like um, what do you see as your 
um, the affinities between your work a little bit? I mean, we'll, we'll pull it out a bit more as we talk, but if there's anything particular you wanted to say about how, because we know we did that, um, that studio visit with you both together. I was wondering whether there was anything that you'd like to add to think about how um, the point at which your work kind of meets. It was just literally amazing. As soon as you turned the projector on, when my sculpture's in the space, and Maggie's film just like filled that wall, and the light was just on. It was just like wow, that was the final piece of the jigsaw, like uh, our works coming together and meeting in a space. Mm. I was, I was, I just wanted to ring you up straight away, Maggie, and be like, oh my god. <laughs> so like, it's so because obviously we were on different continents creating these works, and we met once. Um, so I think it's really cool. I think it's good curation from you guys at Res. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to say on that, Maggie? Um, yeah, I, I'm quite blown away. <laughs> I, uh, I basically, I mean, there's sort of surface stuff, like we both obsessed with Baotou Lake, although that isn't in this film of mine. Mm. Or there's various things Asia's talked about that I I also um, you know have worked with like old Chinese mythology characters and um, uh, yes the fossils of our current world and and time compressions and expansions and um, anyway yeah just trying mm. to access thanks for reminding me <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that. I'm like, I think we're both channeling mm. and seeing your work has reminded me of that. And I thank you for that. Like Aww. it's it's like using art as a sort of seduction into a really beautiful, uncanny, feminine, monstrous, morphing world. And um, yeah, and it, mm. we need to, it's harnessing all this kind of stuff to try and shift people's perspectives and their fixed identity of what the real is and what matters and yeah you, it's just the political like it's both works are really politically well mine's I don't know if mine's got enough of it yet but politically like I just used to be you know having nervous breakdowns living at Greenham Common in my 20s I was just so angry and now there's you and you're doing this amazing stuff that's got agency and it's reclaiming reclaim we're reclaiming something yeah. anyway there's <laughs> lots, lots lots of good stuff in common yes what's green and common oh sorry it was this women's peace camp oh, where wow. non-violent direct action was kind of established as a way of working you know like if a hundred yeah. people pop up, keep shaking a fence it eventually falls yeah. that kind of thing. that sounds amazing <clears throat> yeah, it was good I <laughs> anyway um, so um maybe um we, want, we could talk a bit about um uh about the technology and how it relates to um, both of your, because um, obviously technology is a very sort of prevalent thematic in both of your works, as you both you know, very eloquently described. Um, so maybe we can talk about that a bit. Yeah, I had a couple of questions about that. Um, so maybe I'll begin with Maggie. Um, by asking about um, the editing and collage techniques that you mentioned. Um, so you were saying you might unpack um, some of these techniques and in particular this term machine vision um, that we hear a lot now, um, but um, we kind of think of machine vision as necessarily this very kind of contemporary vision. Um, but in fact, with Orphan Drift, you were working with what you describe as an analog machine vision. And you're actually um, using domestic VHS tapes at that point. 
um, and uh, you've always used um, a kind of painterly practice, which is analog in a sense, alongside um, the kind of a harder technologies, as you might call them. Um, so this kind of combination of the soft and the hard tech and the analog and the digital. Um, and so that's a kind of orphan drift side is the VHS, which I, um, I was kind of reading a bit around orphan drift, but I couldn't quite unpack exactly what the editing techniques were then with the VHS. Then today you have deep dream, you have data moshing, this kind of unpredictable distortion, and you have the LIDAR scanner that you mentioned. And I'm interested in this analog and contemporary form of machine vision and how you've been working with machine vision for so long and perhaps, um, you know, each one of them will reflect a particular given moment in time and the politics of yeah. those moments. And I just wondered for you, how exactly um, do those, um, has the forms of machine vision having changed? How, how has that reflected the changes in politics and, um, and, and how is that reflected in the kind of techniques themselves and also the aesthetics they produce? Um, okay, well, uh... A really quick beginning is I saw this it's at the beginning of our book the cyber positive book from 95 but um I saw this um image diagram that was all of what we can't see going towards ultraviolet and all of what we can't see going towards infrared as frequencies perception frequencies and um what we can as humans see is like this millimeter in the middle of this A4 page. So um, that was mind blowing and just confirmed for me that we really, it's mad to think we know what reality is uh, given that very confined perception. So machines were enabling mapping and collating and visioning in in all these uh ways we couldn't see so that's where we first came up with that machine vision term and then the thing of manifesting invisible frequencies like when aisha was talking about uh wi-fi signal like if we could see it we probably would all just be running for the hills because it's hectic i've, I've seen imaging of it mm. and um but that's like a dark, I think now it's much darker, but anyway, quickly, so I, uh, we wanted to manifest the frequencies that, like, to take away the very male patriarchal fixed central focus vision of, you know, images on a screen, the male gaze, all that kind of stuff, and um, if you open um, machine vision capture methods like VHS tape to disruption, uh, which one would do by waving TV aerials around or playing the tapes over and over and over fast, 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 um, like at high speed, and they just degrade. So you start getting, and then you layer them, and with very basic old school mixers, you mix them and they're looking for something to recognise and then you get all these pulses and shivers and... Um, yeah, there's no fixed central gaze and, and imagery is always dissolving. So that was our intention there, really. Um, mm -hmm. And also it fitted with stuff to do with the invisible, you know, a kind of shamanic sense of... Mm -hmm. And the just swarming complexity and quantum nature of reality and the unfixity and the endless possibility and fluidity and... Uh, which uh, mm -hmm. links into a fem sense of what I think of as feminism, really. Uh, it, but that's later, mm -hmm. I know. Um, so, so in a sense, you're producing the politics through the machine vision. It's not just kind of reflecting. Yeah, but as artists, it was also mm -hmm. very, yeah. But as artists, it was also very um, tactical. Like we worked out because mm. music, digital electronic music, which we were working in clubs a lot, 
and doing performances and stuff were um you know you seduce people with sound very uh strongly and we wanted to find visual ways of mesmerizing them and then you can like insert image into this shivering fluid color field and um mm. i don't know they kind of take them on subliminally or they don't know what's hit them or they're a bit shocked or they're fascinated so mm. you know we had a lot of kind of art concept what we wanted art to be doing as a mm. immersive space a bit like sound in um dance music so uh that was another aspect of machine vision you know it's like faster and more complex and layered and um uh flowing what have i got uh, feedbacking magnetic fields made visible and warping and juddering and all of that playing with time and space and haptic space you know when you've got a sort of you're zooming in macro micro tactile all that felt part of that word machine vision back in the day and then there was a big period mid 2000s when i was very frustrated because i couldn't find a way of doing it to the digital because it's so it's so um mm. captured by corporate capital and um everything was getting smoother and smoother and better and better in inverted commas quality and um you know texture and some sort of materiality was really not what was being um sold and it's only through meeting younger people who've been playing with data moshing or um uh are working in lidar scan and 3d environment modeling but for really boring jobs like you know for architect firms marketing firms not the data moshing mm. that stays mm. hacky but <laughs> Most of these other techniques are absolutely corporate. Um, and that's why I say things. As... I was just going to ask you to describe the process of data mushing before you move on when you say that's the oh, one that's well, key we... and not corporate. We're cheating. We've just um, used these YouTube um, things where you can like an image is a screen frame is made out of um two interlacing fields and you basically take out one field and then you get this broken image information in pixels mm. but i was going to mention if anyone wants to see the best use of data moshing ever it's that jeremy shaw video the liminals where mm which i i mean i wish i'd made that basically <laughs> but uh the idea of this cult who are trying to fuse machinic unconscious on a kind of deleuze guitari vibe i really can't explain that but um they're, they're trying to machine what fuse human consciousness with artificial intelligence or something like that anyway they do all sorts of yoga and shamanic practice and meditation and then they finally and they they get they've got a i think they've been injected with some nanobot stuff anyway they they um end up melt going into kind of synthetic meltdown and that's achieved with very um professionally advanced data moshing because you can basically <clears throat> take a, a, a frame image a frame of an image and you make it into a word a jpeg into a word file so you've got all these code things and then you disrupt the code and um you can control you know a face melting mm. i i i don't have I mean, I would love to be, have the money to um, employ someone who's able to do that, but it's fine. I'm good with flow for the moment. But the fact that this is possible is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And if it's you, all these techniques, like the deep dream code stuff as well, which is quite gimmicky, um, if it's used 
like in the liminals or I'm trying to do in this to, to actually be the degrading swampy miasmic complexity of matter it's trying to make it have a material language or it's communicating as a visual um avatar like it's chan it's it is something it's doing something it's not just a kind of you know facebook mm. uh gimmick with lots mm. of likes you can mm. reclaim it from that when i say corporate i just mean social medias i never predicted social media i never i just <laughs> never i never thought that's what we'd get but it's so interesting hearing you speak about um, this uh, kind of dip in the 2000s when there wasn't necessarily an opportunity to um, interject or reclaim in the way that you're able to do now through these techniques such as data mushing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's super interesting hearing you speak about that trajectory and actually maybe there's like a bit optimistic <laughs> sense in which um you know if you give a technology enough time then there's that opportunity for it to break down and something new can emerge yes, um as a proposal uh, which i think you know, ties into the maybe the overall proposition of the exhibition that you're both working with with this kind of reclaiming this trash and um then finding um new propositions for it so just bringing in this idea of a kind of ruined image um, of technology that uh, this kind of glitchy editing style in Maggie's work, which is about a breakdown of an image and then a production of a new image or new politics. And it kind of makes me think of the way in which the materials in Aisha's Aisha's work, yeah. um, the materials that compose your sculpture, they're these kind of found, discarded materials that kind of compressed amalgams of trash um, that could also be considered this ruin that becomes something new. Uh, and I wondered if you could talk a bit more about these materials and how they lead your work. Um, you know, do you go on missions to collect <laughs> something mm -hmm. specific or you talked about finding the sticks and, um, and and carrying them around for the day and that's kind of part of the journey. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, ha what's that kind of process of um, collecting together the materials? Um, yeah. Well, um, I think about like 95% of the work or like the collected found objects that I use um, are either skipped or charity shopped or car booted. And I like, I'm like a magpie and I like, um, if it sees something that's my aesthetic and that's like my, my genre, I'll just collect it and it will be in a box for like years. And it's really bad. And like, there's moments in my life where I'm just like, I'm just gonna chuck it all away. And then, you know, I'm like, no, it's an art. And then, and then it eventually does find its way into an art, like, um, these ones have and like so yeah it's things that I um so this is like this whole like also this um psychic excavation thing like I a lot of the things I've used in the work I've I literally excavated from the world um around me like skips and stuff years ago psychically thinking oh I'll use that in the future which is kind mm -hmm. of cool um, the wood, the wood, and like the twigs. It's just I'm addicted to picking up sticks. I can't go through a park, and if there's a gnarly looking stick, that's just really beautiful. And I, I find it so libidinal to see like this smooth wood that's all like twisted. And I'm just like, wow, why did Earth make it grow like that? Like, why did it do that? And I like to think about the roots because obviously, like as above, so below. So like the roots are also like mirroring that mm. shape. So something's going on in the ground to make the tree do that up there, which is really cool. And I never chop anything off a tree. Like, that would not be okay. It's all, like... But it's just kind of collected and recycled, because I saw yeah. you do call-outs as well, where you're kind of asking yeah. people if they have any electronic trash. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So sometimes it's you do... Yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. Um, <laughs> cathartic and therapeutic to smash up um, a MacBook or an iPhone, and they are all donated to me. My first MacBook that I smashed up, well, the only MacBook I've ever smashed up, my friend gave it to me and said, you can only have this if you smash up for a piece of art. 
and I have done that now, so that's good. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and also I feel like one of the sculptures in the show, um, uh, they've all got a base of like metal wire frame, um, chicken wire, and the chicken wire in one of them is uh, excavated from an old piece of art that I did in 2014 that I fell madly out of love with. And um, so I was like, I just can't look at that sculpture anymore. I'm just going to hack it and use the frame for another sculpture. And that's kind of cool because, you know, it's not just like an economic thing, like using recycled materials, which is really good. Isn't it? You know, it does save your bank, but it's also ecological because you're not just using mm. brand new material. And maybe that's, yeah, that's the lo-fi aspect. It's just like, just mm. economics and ecologics. Um, it's just, yeah, better for the bank, better for the planet. Because, yeah, I think we're going to move on to speak about ecology a bit more later as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just but, wanted to ask um, uh, um, Aisha, uh, kind of, a, this is a bit slightly unformed, but um, I was just thinking about what you've just been saying and about what you told me just before, what you, what you told the group just before we went online was about, mm -hmm. the, about the Bluetooth, um, about yeah. the Bluetooth uh, load symbol being an amalgamation of different rooms. Yeah. So, um, and I was wondering if maybe you could just explain that. And yeah. um, because obviously your work in the show um, features a lot of um, kind of like a syncretic uh, mysticism, I guess, or um, spiritualism based around a lot of um, very ancient technologies and a lot of um, more contemporary um, symbology as well, like kind of like this kind of total mashup that's um, developed through kind of through your practice, but um, but also I imagine through a kind of personal um, uh, kind of understanding of the world and your own kind of um, position in it as a, a spiritual being and like how that fits with um, uh, yeah, how it fits with your practice, basically. So maybe you can talk a bit about what um, the uh, this kind of language of symbols means to you, mm -hmm. how, how you developed it, and how whether um, you consider them. Because in my mind, they're all part of this uh, language of um, of kind of ancient technologies, which are, you know, um, uh, the the crystals, the symbols, the stone circle the um all of these things which are technologies mm -hmm. which are almost like what's left after the entropic what we describe in the press release as an entropic ritual breakdown which is like yeah. the kind of um falling apart of everything that we've built up which is all mm -hmm. very um which is all this super advanced technology which in your piece in the show is um it's semi-destroyed or completely destroyed and what's left and it's still functioning are these um these ancient technologies mm -hmm. of yeah dismus and yeah. um and also things like herbs as well um but crystals and uh, and runes and maybe you can think um talk a little bit about that in relation to this um the thing you told me about the blue tooth logo yeah um, and just a bit about your relationship between or your understanding of the relationship between mysticism and technology. Okay. That would be a really nice thing to hear you talk about because it's such a problem yeah. thing to all of your work and like the idea of the cyber druid, which you've talked about in previous works. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and just like that relationship is just so prevalent. It'd be good to hear. So um, yeah, that when I found out about that Bluetooth logo being a bind rune, I was literally like mind blown. I was like, because I stare at this logo every day when I like use Bluetooth, which I rarely do because it's really bad for your brain because it's short wave, um, short waves and it penetrates deep into your brain, really bad for you. But um, yeah, it's it's a binding of two runes. One is like, I will be getting this wrong, but like Haggle and the B, the B one. Mm -hmm. And it represents uh, like a Nordic, a Norse um, warrior whose name was something Bluetooth. And I think maybe he was like a communications warrior. I'm not sure, probably. Um, so yeah, and I was interested in bind runes because it's this, uh, runes are so powerful in themselves. But binding them together creates this like uh, hybrid fusion of like energies. And I was binding, so I made like this formula 
uh, it, it's like a really random formula. Nothing's in order. Like that you see, maybe some people might have seen uh, a photo of this um, formula that I've written on a wall. It was used in some of the press for the show. Um, but yeah, and it's just like a bunch of symbols that I really felt connected to. And some of them are chemical symbols, runes, um, gas markings for road works, um, hobo glyphs, quote unquote, uh, which is a um, system of symbols used for travelers and rough sleepers, mainly in America, to find up good places to um, sleep or uh, uh, they're written outside houses of people who are nice who might give you food or places where there's been a, an attack happened or if there's good water in the stream, that sort of thing. Um, so this is like communications through symbols. Um, and yeah, all that really interested me and I wanted to create this, gen this formula for a genderless, optimistic, Post consumer, which filled um, dystopia. Um, and I was thinking about this today about the technologies of runes and the technologies of symbols, and that kind of also ties into oh, there it is um, the technology of um, crystals and, and mainly more crystals because I think herbs you can cut, you have scientific like backup for a lot of the. Um, benefits of herbs, but crystals and symbols, um, I think their technology has power when you give them the power and when you believe in it. And I think this, it, the, the, their power is obsolete when you don't believe in it and you don't give power to it and you don't learn it and understand it. And so as uh, society is evolving and progressing, and if we do lose our connection to the mystic mystical side, and our connection to the spiritual body, we will create those technologies to be obsolete. We will like, we won't be giving power to them anymore. So I really hope that doesn't happen. I really hope there is that, and I do feel that there is a wave of um, reconnection back to nature and back to the, the mystical side of ourselves. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about how that technology could be obsolete and it is with belief. If you don't believe in it, then you're not gonna understand the power of it. Um, yeah, and I've got this bind rune, which is um, a culmination of algis and the alchemical symbol for Earth. Algis is a protection rune from Norse, the a Nordic protection rune, and um, yeah, and this circle with the cross is uh, an alchemical symbol for Earth, so it's my Earth protection rune, and so it's a bind rune for that. And the handprints there are the left hands. I try to only use left hands in the whole of the show just because I'm reading Ursula Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. Right. I'm on page, like, I haven't finished it yet. It smells really good, this book. Anyway, um, yeah, but I, this is the book I've been reading throughout this whole process. So, yeah, I try to only use left hands. And I'm left-handed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, like, my... Um, exploration into binding of runes and there's there's so much more like I haven't even ever made uh, a sigil and, and and I think that's my next uh, exploration into into symbols and into shapes that can shapes that are technologies that create power like a circle a stone circle is powerful because of the unity and the never-ending um, eternity this like circular there's no end there's no beginning um, like the symbol for the sun I really love because it's a circle with a dot in the middle and the circle represents like what I just said the the, uh, the hole and the never-ending hole and the dot represents the spark of life in the center of that and I really like that. Great, great. Thank you Aisha, that was really good to hear you um, talk about that. Um, uh, I was wondering if um, we should move on to maybe um, uh, if we talk about technology in your both of your works forever because yeah. it's such a yeah. <laughs> it's such a um, it's so good to hear you talk about it. Um, but I was wondering whether um, we should uh, move on to think about um, uh, the the next sort of loose section which we wanted to talk about, uh, which was around um, feminisms and cyber feminism, and because. Um, Alembic is kind of premised on this, um, uh, on 
uh, a sort of cyber feminist legacy. So um, I thought maybe we could ask Maggie um, if you wanted to talk a bit about, because um, I know that Maggie, even though we describe you as being um, of that generation, that I know that you don't, you very specifically don't identify as a cyber feminist. And I was wondering if you could maybe um, talk a bit about, um, briefly a bit about um, why it is you don't identify as that. And if you don't, then how do you situate your practice from the 1990s as a, um, a you know, as being at that time when, um, when the cyber feminism sort of movement was happening? Yeah. Um, well, I think at the time we probably thought it was too human or um, too hopeful uh, politically. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about that and I think I probably have an apology in a way because I was looking at Sadie Plant's zeros and ones since you asked me that, to think about that and um, she describes uh, technology as a notion of feminization understood as complexity, connectivity and disruptive multiplicity, all of which I'm big into. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I didn't, yeah, it, it was, it just felt very hopeful that and I wasn't feeling at all hopeful. I was waiting for um, some kind of machinic unconscious to wipe humanity out and let the planet recover. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anything, anything that was suggesting connectivity and um, you know technology being a friendly, uh, fluid medium in which cyber-tastic communication could happen wasn't really working for me. Mm -hmm. But I understand that I probably was very judgmental on, on that now. But I am I have connected more strongly to um, what's being called xenofeminism and, as you reminded me, uh, Legacy Russell's glitch feminism. And these kinds of ideas are more abstract, they're less human um, and yeah, like describing the feminine as a ch female feminism as a channel to the blank side, to the dark side, to the other side of the cycle. Uh, machines, women, demons align on the dark side of the screen, the inhuman surplus of a black circuit, a line of flight to the desert or the sea. Uh, or something that's transgender, transcending gender, passing through it as movable material, disrupting it as a conspiracy, overthrowing it as socio-cultural regime, the glitch is an idea, glitches, feedback, white noise, interference, static. They're definitely describing edges which we should be inhabiting. Slipper and glitch apparently meant slippery, slippery which I'm always very keen to be mm. so yeah that's kind of i'll leave that because it could go on for ages but um is that some so, kind of an answer Helen has just to, just to mention that the, i don't know if um it was said that the glitch feminism essay it was also part of the the res program Totally so that's, um, that's on the RES website if anybody's interested to check it out. And I don't know if you were actually quoting directly from that there. Yes, I was. I was Some mashing yes. up. I'm from so... Legacy Reverend, Russell. And, <laughs> and Legacy Russell and Helen Hester. Mm, sure and they'll... whoever they were quoting. It's a bit I've embedded. I've got this right in oh. front of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just say one thing? actually, that I remember is Glitch Feminism essay got me remembering the whole idea of digital uncertainty, which is like, I feel like one of the most important scary things going on is 
algorithms being uh, used to um, just reaffirm corporate capitalist agendas and decide who goes to prison and who gets marketed what and um, you know I mean that's so superficial but it's it's running uh, they're running our they're running everything they're running culture and uh, they're manufacturing desire and they're keeping everything linear and um, like to, to unrest algorithm from that kind of controlled input and data analysis, which is the complete human agenda from the um, powers that be, would be absolutely amazing. And so I was thinking the idea of digital uncertainty, like all that stuff that goes on in the black box of what is what are neural nets actually computing, that's a space where we can intervene, not me, but people who... Um, there are a lot of people thinking about how to start doing that because uh, yeah so I sort of read glitch feminism as a very useful way of thinking because um, she says it's activated by the accident I thought that was really beautiful mm. that's it um, so uh to refer to that, that's so that's Legacy Russell's uh, Cyber Feminist Manifesto from 2013. Um, and then her essay that she wrote for us, which will be in the publication. Um, and then as well as that book that Helen waved, uh, the Helen Hester essay that you read was the one that uh, Helen Hester wrote for Res, which will also be in the publication. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I wondered if you could elucidate a little more. Um, uh, earlier in this conversation, you referred to um, uh, fluidity in connection to feminism. We we're talking about not using uh, like um, flow, but um, yeah, just your use of that word. And I just wondered if you could expand on it. it was, uh, um, I suppose I think of fluidity as something you know that uh, Lao Tse, the old Chinese, um, oh my god, my brain's gone, but he wrote this book about... Lao Tse Cheng. He wrote uh, that book about tactics for war. Mm. And I can't Lao remember Tse Ching. Lao Tse Ching, is it him? No, he's called Lao Tse, Tze or something like that. Lao Tzu. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Lao Tzu. Yeah. He wrote, what did he, what's this book? Well, anyway, he wrote that book, which you, I'm sure Aisha will, Aisha will, um, I can feel you knowing it. But I'm anyway. Googling it, <laughs> googling it now. <laughs> the Art of War, maybe it was mm -hmm. called. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's all about like, Bending with yeah, yeah, uh -huh. the reeds and moving with chance and um, finding opportunity to flow rather than confront and be porous and um, yeah. So there's that side of fluidity. There's also I love turbulence. I love ocean. I love um, yeah, vast liquid pressure, space, um, um, and the fact that we're liquid inside so much of us and if we weren't so bound, we'd, we'd be, well, we'd be a horrible mess, but we theoretically, like, otherwise, we could be fluid. And I think the virtual is fluid, is going to be fluid if it's given a chance. Um, you know, not, not fixed, always multiple possible becomings and uh, yeah I, I mean I think fluid's aesthetic for me it's political it's um, this friend of mine called Betty Marenko who's written loads of papers on digital uncertainty was saying the other side of the digital is the octopus as one of her finales to um, a paper and I just thought oh yes that's a mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, so tentacled and fluid and, you know, male, traditionally male thinking's just so fixed and black and white and... Um, Maybe, yeah. um, Maggie, do you want to maybe just say a, a little bit about your um, your interest in uh, Donna Haraway in relation to that? Oh yeah, um, that's the most important book for me for uh, this last year or so, mm. apart from Prismatic Ecology. But um, so this this is um, staying with the trouble, yeah. It's staying with the trouble, making kin in the Cthulhu scene. Um, such a hilariously great title but um yeah when she talks about ways she basically talking about ways of combining political agency magical creativity poor being porous and um respecting connection to all matter organic inorganic non-human and and to ex that to express grief is a real part of moving forward, like grief for what our species has become and what we've done and just like face your burden of complicity, mm. which we all have. Mm. So she's like, yeah, made me feel like this idea of making kin, you know, moving from shamanic kind of vibe of having a spirit animal or animals teaching you stuff if you actually spend time watching them interact with their environment uh yeah and it not being about gender and human hierarchy and uh and the science fiction vibe of um you know like basically the symbiont children become part of the monarch butterfly because that's becoming extinct and then once it when it's extinct they're like so fused with its dna they seem to be a a chimeric protein form of life so uh yeah I, I loved it and it's a kind of decolonization really one of the buzzwords of today but um yeah and i've been working with uh san bushman mm -hmm. who are the first peoples of the world and they are the most um trashed and shat on community of all the communities of trashed people which is pretty much amazing <laughs> they still exist and they are so into what they they are they lived on a haraway's world they they're multiple dimensional beings they become animal they i don't know they're they're amazing and so that's given me reading that book and working with them has been a been very very important for me the last year maybe that's a good place to um uh talk about the really strong um uh message of um ecology that comes through the work for both of you in um in chrominance um i think sarah had something she wanted to ask about um about ecology in relation to um the geography of um, the well, both the geography and uh, of Cape Town, where you made the film, and also in relation to Asia's work. Mm -hmm. Sarah? Sorry, I, oh, Sarah, your mic's off. It was in relevance to the um, edgelands uh, that you've referred to a few times, Maggie, and um, uh, the liminal spaces. And um, I remember you referring to the danger of being where the uh, the beauty being where the danger and the sublime. Uh, are found and and I, I think that's probably in connection to the a kind of Deleuze and Guitarian uh, sublime. Um, so yeah I was thinking about how uh, the miasma work um, when choosing uh, the locations um, it's obviously visually very striking but uh, in terms of the so socio-political and socio-economic situation of the surroundings, which you referred to quite a few times now with the San Bushman and uh, um, for your other project, the, the Batan, Batu Lake, um, but how you, um, how you feel about drawing those together um, when they, 
they're usually quite unpopulated, your films. There's that not that, you know, the, the figure is quite a scarce um, um, feature. Um, yeah. yeah. Event. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of, yeah, I suppose the question is about whether that, whether that, um, whether that's part of the liminal nature, this um, being on the edgelands of the socioeconomic and also like an edgeland of a geographic region. I think one thing I really has kept me part in South Africa the last decade now is, um, it's all so raw and transparent, like the cost of our um, lifestyle and the, yeah, the, I mean, because there's so, there's an absolute tsunami of extremely poor people living in, in shacks, uh, like that never, it just gets more and more. And um, so they make a plan, they recycle, but they also burn a lot of plastic for fire to, for cook, to cook on. And they, um, you know, none of their vehicles would pass any test in Britain. Uh, so there's like just clouds of pollution, like, my God, is that a fire? Oh no, it's somebody's exhaust. And um, what was that going? Oh yeah, I, I mean, the, those edge lands are, I mean, I have got a bit of a tendency towards being a disaster tourist, which I'm dealing with, but um, the, the edge lands are absolutely compelling in, like, it's not, you feel a bit tense being white in a, with a camera and stuff there, uh, because you know, lots of people who have nothing would quite like one's iPhone or whatever, obviously. But so, but if you actually can just be and hang around, the amazing things happen. Like this underpass just leading out to the sea, which is the last bit of the film. Um, these like six women came down at low tide and disappeared under the underpass and they had stashed all their clothes there and they lived there. And they got into like really sassy outfits and put amazing wigs on and loads of makeup and then climbed back down again and went to work. And that was mind blowing. Or this guy got out of the gutter who's a transvestite and um, he like keeps all his outfits under the, under a, one of those manholes near the canal. Like there's just such an amazing world going on in holes and and nooks and crannies and and um yeah. So it's not just about the rubbish and the dispossession and the poverty and yeah, I don't know. But I've I've always liked things that aren't I've always liked spaces that haven't got lots of humans in because I, I, I'm very, I've got a lot of antennae about people's energies and particularly in the world that everyone has to live in at the moment that a lot of people's energies are very heavy or fractured or frenetic or intense and I, I find them a bit much so um, mm. yeah <laughs> and if I'm answering no. Is there anything else you wanted to say to that, Sarah? Um, I didn't talk about the sublime, did I? No. <laughs> um, I think the sublime is um, a really important thing for me in my art practice because it's it harnesses um, fear and desire. dissolve mortality and humanity uh, like you know when you're watching a amazing scape or storm or it's just bigger than you like that's a really cliche sort of thing to say but uh 
I think it. I think being made to feel small and in a moment of epiphany is um, a, quite a important experience for me. Mm. Um, I was wondering if this is possibly a good point to bring Asia um, yeah. back in to talk about um, their relationship with uh, to. Ecology. There's actually a question that Stephanie Moran, who um, is an artist uh, that we've been working with, um, uh, is an artist and um, was previously based at Goldsmiths, who we've been working on with the development of the, the Kathy Huffman project in the early stages. She sent a question in that um, actually is um, aimed at uh, this it for Asia around um, um, ecology and um, let me just find it. Um, so yeah, so it's around um, ecology and environmental politics. She says, um, Aisha, I see your work as performing a kind of decolonizing identity and environmental politics. Um, I wonder what your take on this is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really like that reading into my work um, because yeah, that's kind of um, what I think about. And I was thinking, um, Obviously, I try and break down gender within, like, th especially this current work. Um, it's entitled Parasites of Pangu, and I haven't actually talked about that yet tonight, and I just want to briefly talk about it. Pangu was a, is a Chinese creation myth, and in pretty much all of the um, writings of this myth, um, they use he, him pronouns for this god or this spirit who has created earth. And that was created through um, yin and yang was the chaos, chaos and uh, order. And Pangu was the spirit that held these two things apart for 18,000 years and their body grew 10 feet um, like every day or something. Um, and it's quite funny because we measured the ceiling of res and we realized the lights that were shining the light upon the sculptures were 10 feet tall, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, and Pangu, I've always just had such a problem with um, identifying some these creation myths with genders because it doesn't make sense that a god is a gender if they are the god that created gender because who created that person's gender? Who created that spirit's gender? And um, so I've always seen Pangu as this um, genderless being. And um, so, yeah, and the parasites of Pangu are... So when finally Pangu was so tired that they gave up and sort of like just, um, just dissolved. And as they dissolved, they became the earth. So their breath became the wind and the mist and their blood became the rivers. Their hair became the stars in the sky and um, the, their bones became the crist uh, or the earth and the bone marrow became crystals and rare earth minerals and the parasites that lived on the body of Pangu became the humans and I love that because I definitely think that we as a civilization or as, a, as, a, um, as humankind are parasites upon this sacred earth and we're ruining it. So yeah, I really like that. And, and so the decolonizing of the identity of these creation myths is quite important to me. And um, yeah, and also just like switching the gaze of like a, a Western creation myth because, you know, like the, the God myth, the, the Christian God myth, because um, there are, there's many more creation myths, there's Nordic creation myths, but this kind of, I mean, I do have a Chinese heritage, so that's maybe why this really draws, like, Pangu really draws me in. Um, but, yeah, and thinking about how that relates into the sculptures, like, Inner Mongolia as a place um, where this lake exists, this Baotao Lake, which is just a, if people knew, if people really knew that this lake was the creation of their own greed, but it was created by the greed to, and the need for iPhones and electric cars. Um, we'd maybe think twice or a bit more about um, updating our iPhones all the time or just wanting more electronics. And I think this, um, 
like if we talk about uh, if we talk about geography as well in this, the companies do send uh, or do um, have these places that are like a stain on their um, production in faraway places that aren't in the, the West because it's then a mythical place and it's a place that isn't in the, at the forefront of consumers' minds. So we can be told that this place exists. We can be told that children are mining for cobalt in the Congo for little or no pay and they've, they're orphans who are then just stolen to be um, used in the mines. We can be told that but until we see it on our doorstep, we're not really going to um, believe its truth. So I think this idea of geography within the production of electronics is really like um, political as well. Um, so yeah, I really want to use, I really want to talk about that within my work, just to remind people that it's still happening, even if it's all the way on the other side of the world. Um, yeah. Um. Was there anything that anyone wanted to add to that or ask Aisha about that? I, I actually had an additional question, which is that you I've heard you use a few times the phrase op, uh, optimistic dystopia. Oh, yeah. And I wondered if you could unpack it a little. OK, so. Um, so a few years ago, I read Jesse Darling's um, Facebook status, which was um, the apocalypse has already happened. It's just not evenly distributed. And that really hit me. I was like, oh, yeah, like that is so true. And also the etymology or the, or the real um, definition of apocalypse is to reveal or for the veil to be lifted or drop, dropping of the veil, which is the revealing of the truth. So an apocalypse isn't just like the end of the world. It's a revealing of truth or a revealing of, um, yeah, of, of, or a change of situation that really does um, happen every day to marginalised communities or um, places that isn't like the rich West. So um, I think also I was thinking about utopias and really for a while was pining for a utopia and realising, wait, if I want utopia, um, I'll kind of have to become a dictator within that uh, because that person wouldn't want the same utopia as me. Our, our needs and our, our experiences are so different that there can never truly be one utopia. Um, so I was thinking, well, we're obviously living in a dystopia. Um, and that kind of excited me and kind of made me really sad. And then I just thought that the need to be optimistic and the need to nourish ourselves and nourish our friends and nourish our families, if, if you know, this apocalypse is the is happening all around us and you know the the resources the finite resources that we rely on for our modern day needs are running out then to to make our lives more sustainable and more nourishing and connecting is the only way i can see forward so an optimistic dystopia for me is um creating that nourishing and sustainable environment and doing everything we can with our privilege and with our power to share that with other communities. And also I was thinking about past lives and future lives. And I was like, what if I, if I die and I come back as another spirit, say if I come back as a Buddhist monk, how in the future, what if, you know, half the world's underwater mm -hmm. and I can't, like my life as that monk would be um, I was just basically thinking I have to protect the future for my future lives, basically, like my future existences or my family's future existences. And it's just this idea that, yeah, we just have to stay nourishing and sustainable and optimistic because the dystopia is happening. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, it's good. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I'm aware of a bit aware of time. Um, and... Um, there was a couple of other questions from Stephanie, but I think they've actually been covered um, already in the discussion because they were around um, the relationship between your works and um, uh, and how the process came about. So I think if there's any other um, comments that people would like to make um, to add now, is there anyone that would like to say anything else? 
Mm. Oh yeah, I want to say um, this um, thing. So I've also, uh, my most recent film, which is showing up in Manchester at Caustic Coastal as part of a Beacon show, um, I, I, I wrote a line in it, which I kind of think relates to what I've just talked about. Right. And it is, the white man built the black mirror you hold. And I wrote that and I was like, whoa, that's powerful. I'm going to put that in my film. And then um, made the film. And then I was listening back to it and once it was installed and I was like, wait a minute. That may be true. The white man did design the black mirror, the black mirror as in the phone or the computer. Our future is literally being built by white men. Like if you look at the photos of the recent graduates from MIT, they're mainly all white men. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's kind of like scary or like, not yeah scary that that's our future being built by them but it's not being built by them it's being designed by them and they are sending the designs off to non-western countries to, for, for black and brown hands to build it and that's also really shocking or not even shocking just like reality check that it's not just white men building a future it's white men designing the future and 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 um at the expense of other communities and at the expense of our planet, mm -hmm. um, building these technologies that are governing our future. So I think I just wanted to talk, just say that. No, that's great, thank you. Can I say another Black Mirror thing? Yeah. yeah. I, Aisha, so Black Mirror in voodoo in Haiti is, mm -hmm. um, Black Mirror is the way forward. Black Mirror, yeah. not saying it's a different Black Mirror though. Yeah. It's through water down into the world of the ancestors who are in the past and the future and all around us. And um, it's a Black Mirror that is not, it's not got a human male white agenda. So yeah. try and read about that one. It's the most beautiful okay. thing. Thank you. I will definitely read about that. Thanks, Maggie. Great. Um, so if anyone else has got anything to say, then um, maybe we'll wrap it up there. Um, it's been really great to hear uh, everyone's thoughts on the show. Um, the exhibition is still on until April the 28th. Um, so please, if you haven't seen it, then do come down um, and check it out. You can watch Maggie's film in full and see Aisha's work um, in situ. Um, and we have uh, the publication coming out in June and the third show in the series, which is, as I mentioned, is um, is the um, duo show between Shuli Chang and um, Annabelle Craven-Jones. That opens on Thursday, May the 10th um and then runs into june and helen has something to say <laughs> oh just that um i thought i would mention the closing event my performance yeah yeah, yeah I'm doing <laughs> so that's be on <laughs> friday the 27th so yeah. the second to last day so we'll have a yeah performance from maisha yeah we'll yeah i'm really excited for that <laughs> yeah. I actually have, I'm like, um, yeah, I'm making a costume and everything. So you should all come. <laughs> Amazing. Great. So both Maggie and Aisha will be there in person. Oh, Maggie, Maggie at the moment is in South Africa, but she's going to be there too. So you'll get an opportunity to meet the artists in person. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, great. Okay, great. Well, thanks for everybody for your. Um, great thoughts for um and uh yeah we um if there's any other um uh we, we maybe we can post some of the links for things we mentioned in the comments uh, mm. um and this will be saved and archived on the res youtube channel so great thank you for tuning in thanks everybody yeah. thanks. thanks for the hangout <laughs> <laughs>